thing that you have to remember here is that, that centering prayer as a method is two things at the same time, and you must never forget either one. It's a relationship with God, and that's why in the first lecture that usually precedes the uh, imparting of the method, we try to fix the centering prayer method in the Christian contemplative tradition, and more specifically, in the Lexio Divina tradition, in which it has a part without being identified with the four stages of Lexio. It facilitates the movement from uh, the discursive meditation and reflective and visualization aspect of Lexio to the resting in God, the movement beyond thoughts and concepts to simply be in the presence of God and engulfed in that uh, divine sense, whether felt or unfelt. So this is a mistake that is easily made uh, or a confusion. Uh, unless you firmly emphasize the relationship as prayer, then the discipline doesn't make too much sense because it's not a mental discipline. It's not designed to fix your mind or your blood pressure or, or your help you to grow hair or other things. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's a relationship first and foremost, and the method is totally in the service of that relationship. And, and so uh, let's look at the guidelines then from that perspective. In this talk, we're emphasizing the method and so you could easily get stuck on, well, how I've got to do the method just right. But it's always a relationship. And that means, uh, unlike certain other disciplines, if you don't do it correctly, it doesn't matter. It's a help if you do it correctly. But it doesn't matter because it's your intention that counts, and, and the relationship is with God. And God sees that you're trying hard to do a nice job, the best you can, however much you're stumbling. He's not going to hold your mistakes against you. He's looking at your love and, and through another person or a book or eventually or through the inspirations of the Holy Spirit, you'll correct whatever mistakes you're doing. The main thing to do is to do it. The, 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 the principal method of centering prayer really is to sit down. Now that isn't too hard for most people. <laughs> Once you sit down, then the, the Spirit has sort of got you, especially if you're determined to sit there for the 20, 25 minutes that you have agreed upon. And if you do that every day, then your mistakes or misconceptions will gradually evaporate. Doing it is, is the primary uh, discipline. But uh, there's ways of doing it that could facilitate this sitting there. <laughs> And, and so let's look at the guidelines. Now, uh, the first guideline is uh, choose a sacred word as the symbol of your intention to consent to God's presence and action within you. Notice, please, God's presence and action. So we're working with a dynamic relationship, a back and forth, an exchange, a conversation which has moved towards communion or, or is moving in that direction. The second uh, little guideline is that sitting comfortably and uh, with eyes closed, we settle briefly, like I'm settling in this nice chair, uh, breathing easily and so on. And then after a few moments of not doing anything, just sort of settling, pausing, maybe 10 or 15 seconds of quiet, you introduce very gently, very casually, almost informally, the sacred word that you had chosen in the first guideline uh, that symbolizes the consent of your will to God's presence and, and action within. They always go together. God is not a statue. He's not a a static force within us. It, it's, it's a loving relationship uh, in faith. And hence, God's spirit can do all kinds of things and suggests all kinds of things, and he does. Uh, 
The third uh, guideline is when engaged with your thoughts, return ever so gently to the sacred word. Well, this is just to say or acknowledge the fact that there are going to be various thoughts, feelings, sense perception, sense perceptions, noise in the room, people coughing, uh, memories, imaginations, visualizations, uh, sort of dreaming. All of this psychological material, you might say, is going to be flowing down the stream of consciousness as you, as you sit there. And it's, it's, uh, it's, we say that it's inevitable integral and normal. So this is a terribly important point to get through our heads if we've been trained in the doctrine of distractions, that distractions somehow are harmful or inter interfere with your prayer. Now, if you're doing discursive meditation when you're supposed to be thinking about something particular, then, then other thoughts are distractions, do interrupt your reflection and your prayer. But the centering prayer moves beyond that level of awareness. And, it, and, it's, and, it's, got, and it's designed to, to disregard the ordinary thoughts or activities of our psychological day-to-day -day awareness. So you're not on the level that you're usually on in discursive meditation. And hence, uh, we just disregard this thought or these thoughts which are more like noise in the street or, or background music at the supermarket that you put up with but pay no attention to. But it's important uh, not to resist these thoughts. In other words, uh, it's, it's important to have a, a joyful attitude towards the thoughts, a friendly attitude towards the most dreadful thoughts. Not that you linger over them or act them out, but it's important that we expect them and they're normal and they're integral and, and, and so we receive them all with a smile, sort of, inward smile, so to speak. Uh, a jolly attitude <laughs> is, is recommended. Here they go again, that sort of thing. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> Reason for that is that any emotional frustration or annoyance or, <laughs> or distress or grief is not appropriate because that is another kind of thought. Because it's emotionally charged, it's more of a hindrance to entering into interior silence, which is the proximate goal of this prayer, than any number of casual thoughts that go by. So as soon as you're annoyed, you have a second thought, which is much more disturbing than the first one. And so there really is great, uh, great wisdom in, in taking for granted there's going to be lots of thoughts and endless thoughts and that with practice you can disregard most of them. Now the term thoughts is a technical term in our uh, centering prayer practice. And it's an umbrella term. <coughs> we could have used another term, but this one kind of got stuck, in which any, any perception whatsoever is referred to. That is, inner and outer sense sensations, memories, feelings, emotions, plans, commentaries. Uh, any perception at all is a thought in the context of the centering prayer practice. That means that every time you are engaged, with any perception whatsoever. According to this third guideline, you ever so gently return to the sacred word. Not because the sacred word has some inherent miraculous power of, 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 dis of stopping the thoughts. It doesn't. Hence, it's a mistake to use it as a bulldozer or a baseball bat to knock the various thoughts out of the ballpark. This prayer is totally nonviolent. <laughs> there's, there's no, no, and, and in fact, it's as effortless as possible. That, so that the very term ever so gently means you return to the sacred word with a minimum of activity. Not only that, but this return is the only activity you initiate in the centering prayer.
In other words, you do nothing except to return to the sacred word when it's challenged by some attractive or repulsive thought that begins to take you out of the uh, disregard of thoughts and out of the developing peace or interior silence that is gradually being insinuated through the Holy Spirit into the spiritual level of your being. Now, the final guideline is very simple. It, at the end of the prayer period, we remain in silence for a couple of minutes. Now, when this is being done in a group, we s sometimes suggest the leader say the Our Father ever so slowly so that it takes two minutes to say it. But obviously, uh, the others don't say it with the leader because they get all mixed up because he, the leader, whoever he or she is, follows their own pace. But the, you just say it ever so slowly. And in fact, I'll, I'll, uh, we'll, we'll give an example of what I mean when, when we bring you into this prayer uh, shortly. So there are the four guidelines. Now, let's take just a minute to look at them uh, a little more uh, in particular. Choose a sacred word as the symbol of your intention to consent to God's presence and action within. The sacred word uh, expresses our intention to be in God's presence and to surrender to this uh, dynamic divine action. We yield to it so that it's, it's, a, uh, it's an opening, first of all, to the action of God and a letting go of our, or at least in our intention, of the obstacles to allowing God to, to uh, impress upon us those attitudes which he, uh, the Spirit may wish to, to present. But we have to take a moment then to choose a word. So in, in a group that is just hearing this for the first time, uh, we say, well, now we're going to take a minute or two, perhaps two minutes, of silence, I invite you to close your eyes and I invite you to look inwardly and to ask the Holy Spirit to suggest a sacred word of one or two syllables that you feel comfortable with and that would express as a symbol or gesture your intention to be with God during this time and totally open to the divine action. So we been then might suggest, after they've closed their eyes, as several several words, and, and normally we suggest uh, one of the sacred names of God or Jesus or, or even Mary, and, and, uh, and, and we just say them slowly and let people uh, sift through that choice and, and come up with one at the end of a minute or two. What are some examples? Well, I suppose Lord, Jesus, Abba, Father, Mother, uh, Amen, or yes even, could be certain words that are hallowed by tradition. You might think of choosing one of those words from another language that might be a little more musical, or that might appear to you, especially if you know the other language, like, like for instance, uh, Kyrie. Now, although I said we take a word of one or two syllables, I, I exercise a certain liberty with regard to the cloud myself. And if the third syllable is just one letter, I don't think it will inter <laughs> interfere with the principle too much. So, so kyrie is, a, is an incredibly loaded and profound uh, word that's been used for centuries. And it means Lord. Kyrie. Kyrie. Okay. Or it, it might be, instead of Jesus, it might be Jesu, which is the Latin. Or what is perhaps even more attractive, it could be the sound that Jesus actually responded to as a child or as a man, which is Yeshua. Notice Yeshua is kind of more peaceful way of saying Jesus. Jesus is a little powerful. But, but this is, it all depends on how comfortable you feel with the word, what is most congenial to you, what is most built into your physiognomy, you might say. 
at this time in your life because holy words get into the body after a while and, and, and say themselves. You might like the term amen instead of, of, of yes. Now, it's, it has to be acknowledged that some people who come to us are in rebellion against the Christian religion or all religions. So, so words that, are, uh, that we would find sacred are buzzwords for them, and so they, they don't, will not be attracted to uh, Jesu or Christe or, or God or something else. And so that's fine because it, it, in, in choosing a word, it's, it's a, it is the meaning that we invest in the word that is more important rather than the inherent meaning of the word itself. So if you choose a word like peace, or its Hebrew form, shalom, as the expression of your intent to be with God, that is what makes it a sacred word. The word then is not sacred because of its inherent meaning or its hallowed uh, place in Christian tradition, but it's, it's the meaning that you give it that makes it sacred. And that is to say, your will has made it sacred, or your intention has, has sacralized this particular sound as an appropriate expression of your intention. And, and so that when it's challenged by thoughts going by, you can easily and gently return to it, and it reestablishes your original intention just to be with God. That's all the sacred word does. It has no surprise meanings no trick effects on your psyche, no profound stirring of the subconscious or the unconscious. It, it simply means what you want it to mean. Well, now suppose the two or three minutes are over and everyone has, has quietly come upon a word that they're going to use. <laughs> the, it's important then to tell them you must stay with that word during the whole time of this prayer because Otherwise, you'll start thinking again. Shall I turn to Amen instead of Amor? And so, so the, the, the whole thrust of the prayer is to stop thinking. Now, this doesn't mean you're not going to have thoughts, but notice this delicate distinction. Uh, we're not going to think about the thoughts. So you can have all the thoughts in the world go by, and they won't interfere with their prayer. It's only when you start thinking about the thoughts, feelings, that you interrupt your original intention of just being totally open to God and that calls for some response to reaffirm your original intention and to get back to where you started. And so you can see that, so that this practice is constantly cultivating your spiritual awareness, the spiritual level of your being, the spiritual level of, of the intellect, which is intuitive, and the spiritual level of, of the will, which is the will to God, the will uh, to open to infinite truth, infinite love, infinite happiness. So the, 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 perhaps that's a good word to sum up this first sort of stage of learning the centering prayer is opening, opening, opening. Now, after a while, this opening is going to be transformed into a letting go of oneself into God. The idea is important of, of, of self. love. The divine love is total gift of self. And this is the, the stream of charity that we're being invited to uh, immerse ourselves in gradually through the process of uh, non-conceptual prayer, especially one that is as receptive as the centering prayer is. So I, I've spoken now uh, enough, I think, about the sacred word, the first guideline. Uh, just a few words about the second guideline, which is sitting comfortably and with eyes closed. We sit comfortably so that we won't have to think about how uncomfortable the body is. Because all 
forms of thought or impressions we're trying to let go during this prayer. Secondly, we close our eyes to let go of our external environment and also of our interior world that may be thinking about this or that when we sit down. So closing the eyes is also closing the inner eyes to whatever is going on in our interior world. Uh, we don't cease to bond with those we may be with. Actually, this, this whole movement implies a, an immersing ourselves in the, in the redemptive attitude of Jesus into the Paschal mystery, which is sharing the pain and the joy and the, and the needs of the world so that our prayer is an implicit prayer for every, everything God wills, an implicit prayer for everybody in need without mentioning any names. There's another time when we may be called to pray specifically for certain events, but since we only ask for a half an hour or so twice a day, you have the whole 23 hours of the rest of the day to pray as much as you like for other people or do whatever you like. Or do other forms of prayer. This uh, centering <coughs> prayer does not bring other forms of prayer to an end, but it does put them into a into a new perspective, a deeper meaning, and, and one sees their, their, them from a kind of unified perspective in which they're all moving, each in their own way, towards this deeper awareness of the divine presence, both in ourselves and in everyone else and throughout the cosmos. So as having chosen the sacred word, we don't change it. Now, it's true the first few days you might try one or other word, but it's important to settle on one and to stick to it because it eventually it gets sewn into the psyche ever deeper and deeper and deeper. And, uh, and uh, now let's look at the, at the third one, which is perhaps the most crucial one for most of us. When engaged with your thoughts, return ever so gently to the sacred word. Uh, we said that thoughts are, are inevitable. Uh, we said they were integral. In other words, they're a part of the prayer. And as, as far as we can tell from our present level of experience, they're integral because your thoughts may be coming from the unconscious and may be part of the process of healing that I'll come to later in my next lecture. As the, the spirit works as a kind of divine therapist. And one of the ways that he heals the unconscious is by allowing uh, its feelings and its thoughts to surface, especially during prayer, and then later sometimes outside the time of prayer. But it's, it, it is precisely the programs in the unconscious, or what psychology calls the dynamics of the unconscious, that hinder the free flow of grace and hence need to be addressed by the Spirit, brought to our attention, and we have to let go of them, both in our prayer and, and the consequences of them in daily life. So that you can see right away that the centering prayer involves the whole of life and, and, and the activity by which we bring its fruits into daily life is almost as important a factor in the project as the actual time that we faithfully spend each day in the prayer itself. Thoughts are a normal part of centering prayer. As I already mentioned, a jolly attitude helps very much. But it, it works somewhat like this. Suppose you were in deep conversation with someone you loved and high up in an apartment house and the windows are open, the traffic is going by, and the noise you can't stop. But all of, uh, all of a sudden, there's a crash in the street and the decibels go up, and you naturally feel a curiosity to go see what happens. Well, this is what happens when interesting thoughts or boats come down the stream of consciousness. We want to we want to look at them, or what, what are we going to have for supper, and so on. 
and then as you as your mind begins to look at this thing or as let us say the young man begins to go to the window to see what the accident was he suddenly remembers oh what am i doing i'm in this deep cheek to jowl conversation heart to heart conversation i'm i'm not interested in it's not a time to go look at see what's happening outside or to judge what we're really going to have for dinner and so you you want to reinforce or reaffirm the original tete-a-tete that you were having. And so what would you do? You would, you would turn your eyes back towards the beloved, your friend, as a gesture of, of renewing the conversation from where it got somewhat disturbed. Or you might say, excuse me. Or you might say, as I was saying. Well, that's what the sacred word does for you. It, it's when you are are lifted out of your basic intention and start watching thoughts that you're attached to or have an aversion to, that you need to do something to return to the sacred word. But if the thoughts are just going by like noise in the supermarket and you're, you're not paying any attention to it, you're just dimly aware that it's happening, then there isn't a necessity to go back to the sacred word because you're already at the place that the sacred word is meant to facilitate your reaching, which is the abiding, uh, turning, and resting in the presence of God within you at, at the deepest level. So let me just sum up very briefly in this uh, modest diagram here what, what uh, I'm trying to say. Uh, suppose that this is our ordinary awareness the stream of consciousness that we're experiencing during the time of prayer. And here are a few boats that are going by, boats representing thoughts, feelings, images, and so on. And there's usually a, f a fleet of them. Sometimes the whole United States Navy seems to be going down <laughs> with all the guns banging and so on. So whatever your experience, you're having uh, thoughts going by at this level. At a deeper level, let's call this the ordinary level of, of our awareness, and let's call this the spiritual level of our awareness, which you're really not aware of most of the time except at a peak experience or, or when life or tragedy or something brings you to that place. So we're mostly unaware of what might be called the river itself on which all our thoughts and faculties are resting. So we're kind of absorbed or dominated in our ordinary psychological life by the objects of, of events and people and our emotional reactions to them. The purpose then of the centering prayer is to move from this level to this level. And indeed, not to stop there because the the human being has, has greater depths than that, but to move even deeper to the level of the true self, which is our participation in the divine life, and the divine presence itself as the source of our being at every level. And it's accessing or awakening our awareness to this presence that is the ultimate goal of, of contemplative prayer or centering prayer. But to reach it, we have to pass through the spiritual level and to awaken the true self and, and whatever of, of God's ultimate divine presence he may, may want to share with us, which is a whole new life, which is a transformed life, and which it seems to me is what the gospel invites us to, especially in St. John, where. Jesus speaks of inviting us into the same union and unity that, that he experiences with the Father in the Holy Spirit. Hence, this is so important, uh, again, from the perspective of prayer as relationship. Now, there are lots of prayers at this level, our vocal prayers, our reflections, and our divine office, and, and the sacraments. But each of these things, especially the sacraments, has this mystical depth or this mystagogic uh, teaching which, which in, uh, helps us to understand 
the, the symbols of the church from this level in which they are transformed and their meaning becomes uh, immensely more powerful, more attractive, and more personal, as well as, at the same time, bonding us with everyone else who is having a similar experience in grace. And, and that, uh, we might say that the Centering Prayer is primarily involved in awakening this particular level as a preparation for going deeper still, which is the work of, of the various stages of contemplative prayer in mystical life. 